Okay, I presume I have to stay close to the mic. No. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, we've been running, or some, some of us have been running on Blue Waters for quite a while. We have a new PRAC this year, and the PI is Paul McKenzie, so that's changed, but I've made the presentations for the last several years. We also have some new collaborators from the RBC collaboration, and uh, the people uh, at JLab are no longer involved, and the physics has changed a little bit. Um, so what are some of the challenges that we have? So um, it's important for the people in the Lattice QCD community to support the large experimental programs in both high energy and nuclear physics. Here we'll concentrate on high energy physics. Quantum chromodynamics is a strongly coupled nonlinear quantum field theory, so you can't deal with it uh, for what we're interested in in terms of Feynman diagrams. And the best technique we know of is Lattice QCD. It's a first principles calculational tool and if you're really smart and can figure out how to solve QCD without the lattice, it's fine with me. I'm at retirement age, and it'd be good for your career. But uh, this is the best we can do right now. And we have two different parts of this PRAC. In the one part, we study what are called highly improved staggered quark action, which was developed by the HP QCD collaboration. And we use that to study the fundamental, or to calculate fundamental parameters of the standard model. Uh, these include quark masses and CKM mixing matrix elements, and I'm going to talk about the CKM mixing later. Uh, thanks to Mark Neubauer for his nice discussion of the standard model. I don't have to do too much on that. Um, we also use the domain wall action, and we use that because it's a chiral action. It has very good uh, properties for light quarks uh, or light mesons like pions. And uh, so we study pion and kon properties in that. One is direct CP violation, which uh, k, k on decaying into two pions, and the k long, k short mass difference. And I'm not going to concentrate on that. Uh, so one of the questions we are asked to concentrate on is why blue waters? Um, so the calculations we've been doing, and these have been going on for, for many years in general, uh, consist of two stages. First, we generate uh, what are gauge configurations, which are snapshots of the fields in this quantum field theory. And uh, we have to average over them, so we store a bunch of those uh, fields as we're doing this uh, generation of the gauge configuration. And then we can compute the uh, different physical observables on these stored configurations, and many physical observables. Um, to cr create the configurations, you have a stochastic evolution. And uh, so that st stochastic evolution should only consist of a few streams of running. Uh, however, once you've stored um, those results uh, on a tape drive, usually, and disk, um, you can now run any physics problem you have or you want to do in parallel if you have enough capacity. And so Blue Waters is good for us. Uh, I can't see that, oh, okay. Uh, because of the GPUs, uh, we can use that for some of our production running. Although, uh, sensibly, Blue Waters is designed with not an overwhelming number of GPUs, and they're very busy, so most of the capacity is actually in the CPUs, and that's what we've been using mostly. Uh, we need rather large partitions to generate the gauge configurations. Uh, for the uh, analysis of the stored configurations, we could actually run many parallel jobs because we have generally hundreds or often a thousand uh, stored configurations. Okay. Now, one great thing about Blue Waters is its high speed. It turns out it's very expensive to use up and down quarks as light as they are in nature. And Mark mentioned the different quarks. Up and down are the two lightest ones. Uh, so in the past, it's been necessary to use heavier quarks uh, than up and down and extrapolate, and this re resulted in a certain er error, uh, but there's a way of trying to control that called chiral perturbation theory. But it's still nice that with blue waters, we can actually go down to the physical quark mass, uh, which we've been wanting to do for a long time. And being able to run with such light quarks allows us to get unprecedented precision, which I will try to convince you of. Um, so we've been producing more configurations on blue waters this year, and uh, there'll be many more physics results coming out over a period of years beyond actually the lifetime of blue waters in all probability. 
Um, I wanted to uh, mention that uh, Greg Bauer, Craig Steffen, and David King were very helpful to us in helping to establish a dedicated queue. Uh, Blue Waters is very popular because it's such a great machine and it hasn't always been easy to get our jobs run. Okay, uh, one of the things we were asked to talk about is shared data. And I mentioned to you that we create these configurations and you can do lots of different physics problems with them. So we make the configurations that we create on Blue Waters and elsewhere available through uh, USQCD, which is a large scale collaboration of most of the people doing numerical calculations in QCD in the US. Um, we've in the past made these available through something called the Lattice Data Grid and the Gauge Connection, which uh, Bill knows was uh, NERSC and uh, started there. It's still, still useful, but I th don't think we've uploaded our lattices to there yet. Um, so um, I'm from the Milk Collaboration, and there's a, a little larger collaboration, or Fermilab Lattice and Milk, that engage in physics projects together. And we're going to be using the configurations for several years to look at weak decays beyond what I'm going to show you here today. And then there are a number of other groups in uh, US QCD who also use our configurations. And actually, I've been transferring a couple of uh, terabytes of data to India recently, and I forgot to check in this morning to see how that's going. Um, and sometimes we save quark propagators for other physics projects. So um, why does this matter? Well, we've already heard about the standard model from Mark, so I can uh, skip the first bullet and sub-bullet. The standard model actually explains a great wealth of experimental data, uh, but it uh, turns out that it only does that when we know some parameters about it that are basically theoretically free parameters. And these include the masses of the quarks in the theory, the strong coupling constant, and what we're going to talk about later, the CKM matrix, which is a mixing matrix. Uh, there are also theoretical reasons why we think the standard model is incomplete. Mark talked a little bit about grand unified theories. There's also dark matter. Okay. There are also a number of experiments in which there are tantalizing two or so, two or more standard deviation differences between the standard model theory and the experimental observation. Um, and I'll only get to talk about maybe one of those briefly later. Actually, that, that's not quite true. Um, and so many of the interesting properties of the strong force require better calculations in QCD. Um, so we calculate first principle calculations in QCD. Uh, as I mentioned, we only know how to do it right now using large scale numerical calculations. And one of the, uh, many of the parameters in the standard model are uh, summarized in something called the CKM mixing matrix. Uh, Mark also mentioned weak decays. And when the heavy quarks decay, they can decay into different combinations of the lighter quarks. And uh, Kobayashi and Maskawa received the 2008 Nobel Prize for um, in, you know, realizing theoretically that you need to have this matrix. And it turns out that they left the, the job of figuring out what numbers are in the matrix to uh, those of us uh, who soldier on. And we're going to talk about how we've done that with increasing accuracy. Um, one interesting thing about this is that if you calculate two different decays that depend upon the same mixing matrix element, and you get different values for that mixing matrix element as inferred from the experimental observation, that means there must be some new physics that's not there in the standard model. That is prize worthy. And I think you know what prize I'm referring to. Um, and so there are a number of high energy and nuclear physics experiments that really need more, interpret more uh, theoretical input from QCD. Okay, uh, this is a picture of Kobayashi and Muskawa. And I like it because it's after they got the prize and they don't really look that happy to me but maybe they do to you, but uh, anyhow. Um, this is the matrix, and um, the part in bold is actually the matrix. So VUD, VUS, VUB, et cetera. That's the first row of the matrix. Each element of the matrix on the left is labeled by a charge two-thirds quark, up, charm, and top. And the right 
hand elements or indices are down, strange, and bottom, which are the charge minus a third quarks. So all six quarks come in here, three of charge two thirds, three of charge minus a third, it's a three by three matrix. Under the bold, I have some physical processes, decays, and, and the last row also mixing, and these processes depend upon those matrix elements. So we're gonna talk, for instance, about pion decay into a lepton and a neutrino and some other decays. We'll get into that in a second. Okay, so first I wanna talk about uh, light quarks. And uh, so these decays in uh, blue are leptonic decays where a pion decays into a lepton which could be an electron or a muon and a kaon decays into an electron or a muon and a neutrino. So there's no a strongly interacting particle in the final state that makes it relatively easy. There are also semi-leptonic decays, such as a kaon decaying into a pion, which is a lighter meson, and a lept again, a lepton and neutrino. That's also been studied on blue waters, but not anymore, uh, that allocation completed. So this is a little bit about the theory of the decay constants. Um, so um, the the actual physical rate of the meson decay depends upon a particular CKM matrix element, okay? And it also depends upon the decay constant which we calculate on blue waters and other known quantities. And so what we have to do is make a very accurate determination of the decay constant and then using an accurate experimental result, we can get a good result for the CKM matrix element. And so here's the formula down here. This is the experimental observable, G sub F is well known. Um, this is the next factor, is the CKM matrix element we want to determine. Uh, then there's a measured experimental lifetime, and here's the decay constant that we uh, calculate on blue waters, and then these are well-known masses of particles. So the key is there are two unknowns on the right-hand side. If we can calculate F, we have a result. And uh, given the limited amount of time, I probably will just skip on uh, the notation, uh, different, uh, different values of Q were different quarks. Okay, I'm gonna be showing you a bunch of graphs from the Flavor Lattice Averaging Group, which publishes uh, a reviews, so this is now third review, and they have state-of-the-art uh, comparisons of different lattice calculations. I'm a member of the heavy quark semi-leptonic decay group, so I don't feel like I'm just grabbing graphs from anybody that I didn't have anything to do with. Um, uh, you should know about how flag results are displayed. They're gonna be, in each graph, solid green points, which are included in the lattice average, open green points, which are good calculations but superseded, red points, for which the systematic errors were not well controlled, so they don't go into the average, and then a black point at uh, the top of each case, uh, and a gray vertical band showing the flag average. Um, and then uh, simulations or calculations in QCD can use varying numbers of dynamical quarks. The earliest ones only used up and down. Um, we've been using up, down, and strange for you know, a decade and a half. So that's denoted as two plus one. And more recently, and particularly what we're doing on Blue Waters now, has denoted as two plus one plus one, where we also have the heavier charm quark. And the bottom and top quarks are much too heavy to contribute and need to be dynamical quarks in this case. All right, so this is the first of our flag averages, which is the decay constants for the pion and the kaon, the two lightest mesons in QCD. And what I'd like to show you is uh, how things have improved. And it's a little bit hard for me to see from here, but um, we mostly do calculations in two plus one and two plus one plus one flavors. So this is, uh, sorry, I'm having a little trouble seeing. Down here is two flavors, and you can see in most cases the errors are kind of big. The earliest plot on this point is from Milk, that's my collaboration, and you can see how big the error bars are back then in 2004. And then if you look up here, our latest calculations from milk, the error bars are exquisitely small. Okay, so there's been a lot of improvement there over the years. 
And um, let's see. Uh, well, we're going to use this to test unitarity. So this is the ratio of those two decay constants, which tends to have higher precision because some of the systematic errors in the calculation are common to the two, and when you take the ratio, you get a better value. So our 2014 value from Fermilab and Milk has a 0.23% error. Um, the experimental result infers a ratio, a ratio of CKM matrix elements, VUS to VUD, times the product of these decay constant ratio is this value, and that error is 0.18%. So you can see that our error is a little bit bigger than the experimental error, um, not that much bigger, but we're going to update this year, and we hope to get below the experimental error so we won't be the dominant contribution there uh, to determine the CKM matrix element. Um, this is a, also from FLAG. It says it's preliminary. It's not. But if you look back, you'll see that FLAG, the errors on two flavors were bigger than 2 plus 1 and 2 plus 1 plus 1. Well, we're responsible for the errors being smaller in 2 plus 1 and 2 plus 1 plus 1. Okay. So it turns out this dashed line over here, that would mean unitarity. 2 plus 1 with its larger errors just barely touches unitarity. But 2 plus 1 plus 1, it looks like we're seeing a violation of unitarity. So if we can get the errors down and the point doesn't move, this could be indication of new physics. So it's enticing. I don't know why that came out in that order, but it doesn't matter. So these were decays using only the light quarks. Um, and now we look at decays that involve the charm quark. And I, again, there's leptonic and semi-leptonic. So this is a decay constant ratio from FLAG for the two charm decays. And again, you can see here's our, the first calculation on this graph is from 2005, Fermilab milk. You can see how big the error bar is. Well, we did a lot better um, a few years later, and so did HPQCD, which, by the way, uses the, the milk configurations. But then if you go up here and look at our latest calculation from 2014, you can see how the error has been reduced. Okay. Um, so that's quite nice. So here's our latest result. Um, and here's the, the flag average, which is very close. The error, 32. Well, our latest results from Blue Water should reduce that error from 32 to 11. I don't have the number, you know, these are still preliminary. And I'll talk, show you a little graph of that later. Okay, so when we have those decay constants, we can get two of the CKM matrix elements. And again, it, deter it depends upon some experimental input, and I've lost my cursor. So there's some, another fl averaging group, the heavy flavor averaging group, which averages experimental results. And they, they report the product of the decay constant that we have to calculate and the CKM matrix element, which we'd like to infer. And so the experimental errors for those quantities are between 2.1 and 4.3%. And then if you use uh, that and our calculation of the decay uh, constant, you can see these are the inferred values of uh, VCD and VCS. And there are three errors here. One is from the lattice. The next one is from experiment, and the final one is from uh, another electromagnetic effect that isn't uh, a calculation that, that we have to do particularly. And what you can see is we are not the dominant source of error here. It's experiment, which of course will improve. Uh, and then this is another test of unitarity in the second row. And so um, the blue band is from uh, VCS, D sub S decay, this is from uh, VCD, and they intersect here, and unitarity would say it has to be along that line. And so there's about a 1.8 sigma tension with unitarity. And, um, well, unfortunately, the, I can't say just when our next Blue Waters results come out, this will get that much smaller, because again, that error is dominated by experiment. But that should get better over time. Okay. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about the bottom quark because uh, Blue Waters has played a really important role for us in that. And I'm going to talk about the B meson leptonic decay. And then we also calculate semi leptonic decays, but generally we use the configurations we created on Blue Waters, but we don't um, 
do the calculations of the other physics results on blue waters, but we do do the B meson decay constants. Okay, so it turns out that um, the improvement in the D meson decay constants came from using this new action called the highly improved staggered quark action, and it works well for the charm quark. Uh, when you're looking at a heavy quark, or almost anything in lattice, QCD, you want the lattice spacing times the mass of the particle to be small. And it turns out for the heavy his quarks, we want to try and keep that ratio A times the mass of the quark less than 0.9. You'll see empirically on the next slide what happens when that's not true. Now the charm quark is lighter than the bottom quark by about four factor of 4.6. So to get the same small result for AMQ, for the bottom quark, you would have to run on a lattice spacing that's almost a factor of five smaller, which of course is very, very expensive. The calculation goes up like the lattice spacing to probably the sixth power or so. Okay, so um, for the B meson, the uh, AMB goes down to 0.84 for the smallest lattice spacing uh, we're using on blue waters now. Actually, that may not quite be true. Uh, 0.042 Fermi's, but for all our coarser ensembles, um, the ratio is much bigger, and you would think you can't do anything with the B quark except on that one uh, ensemble where, um, or the finest lattice spacing. However, HPQCD showed that you can actually infer what's happened by looking at cases and seeing where the heavy quark effects get too big and the results peel off. So I'm going to show you this, uh, and the uh, some of the calculations have done on blue waters um, are really um, are the latest stuff from the latest PRAC. So what we have here on the x-axis is the mass of the heavy meson. So we want the B meson is a lot heavier than the D meson. The y-axis is proportional in a certain way to the um, decay constants that we want to calculate, and one is for a heavy quark and a up or down quark, and the other is for with a strange quark. Uh, we calculate them both at the same time. And the solid vertical lines represent the masses of the meson, so this is a D meson, and this is the, the B meson, so this is where we want to get heavy quarks, and uh, remember that A and B is very big in most of the cases. And then we have uh, our results for three different lattice spacings. Again, um, Blue Waters is instrumental or needed for getting the smallest lattice spacing. And what we see is, um, for instance, the green points, they start to peel off very quickly. So there are these dashed lines uh, for each lattice spacing in the same color as the data that show where A, M, uh, times that quark mass is 0.9. So we'd like to generally be to the left of that to get good results, and beyond that point, the data peels off. So if we could only do calculations with the coarsest lattice spacing here, 0.09 Fermi, it would be very hard to infer what's going on way out here. So we do 0.09, we do 0.06, and then on blue waters, we can do 0.04, and we see that when AMH a times the mass of the quark is uh, small, they all agree, and then finally with blue waters we can get just about to the, the B meson, and actually we, we calculated a point here, but things start to peel off a little bit there. <coughs> okay, um, so what are the consequences <coughs> of that? Excuse me. So this is the flag average from uh, before we were doing this calculation in the latest review. The, the latest flag average has an error of a 4 MeV for the B meson decay constant. Um, well, our results are still preliminary, so I'm not uh, showing the actual result, but uh, based on our analysis, we expect to reduce that error from 4 MeV to 0 0.82 MeV, and that's about a factor of five reduction. Okay, and uh, the errors from the other decay constants will be even smaller. I'm uh, actually uh, kind of at the uh, penultimate slide. Well, not quite. Anyhow, um, I hope I've convinced you that high precision is required. Um, one case, um, 
uh, we, we heard about the Higgs boson before, and the Higgs boson, uh, to do the theoretical calculations for the Higgs boson, you actually need better values of the B quark mass and the strong coupling constant. Those come out of these calculations. Okay, so to really pin down the Higgs, we need that. Uh, another important experiment that has uh, an error is the muon G minus two, which has been moved from Brookhaven to Fermilab, expects to reduce the experimental error by a factor of four. QCD is the dominant source of the theoretical error. We need to reduce that. Um, this just says something about what in particular we did on Blue Waters and uh, some of the things we published, which are mostly from last year, not just from this year. You can read my conclusions, and uh, Dan has already given me the, the evil eye.